Hey, good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's like Dallas said, I'm, I'm doing my second tour, and I'm starting all over. I'm starting exactly where I started 40 years ago. Here I am, here I go again. I feel like deja vu, and uh, back to doing youth ministry. I keep wondering, how'd that happen? How did I get back here doing this? So, um, a guy shouldn't retire. That's the problem. You shouldn't, just shouldn't do that. So, anyhow, Linda and I are now the Young Adults Leader at Harvest City for a little while. Hopefully, we're still doing a few other things on, on top of that, but um, it's good to have a title. So, that's the only one I got left, and um, so that's what I am. Uh, it's great to, uh, to just fellowship with you this morning. I appreciate your prayers. Uh, we believe that uh, my, my, do- my granddaughter um, had a baby on Monday. It was three weeks early, and uh, everything looked great, and the baby went home on Wednesday, uh, but on Thursday night, uh, there was breathing problems, and so we had to take, take, take him to the emergency in Regina, and as soon as they saw him, they said, he's going to Saskatoon, so they called an ambulance down from here and rushed him up here, and he's been in the ICU here for a few days, and they're releasing him out of ICU this morning, so we're grateful for that. That's a real answer to prayer. But then my granddaughter went into an emergency this morning. I dropped her off on my way here this morning. So, um, so I appreciate prayers for her. I appreciate that so much. So God bless you for that. Uh, this morning I want to share something that, that's very simple, simple word. Uh, I think that you know, obviously every one of us wants to be used of the Lord. Amen? And uh, we, want to be, we want God to work through us and move through us. And sometimes we, we think that means that we have to you know, have some super anointing, or we have to have uh, some great ministry uh, in order to really be fulfilled and to really have God use us. And sometimes we, we really miss the obvious, and we miss the simple. And uh, this morning, I want to talk to you about how every one of you can be involved in an incredible ministry this morning. And you can actually start today. You can actually start before you leave this building this morning. And it's a ministry that we often do, we minimize. We don't realize the power of it. And it's an amazing, it's an incredibly powerful ministry. And it can, it can literally change lives. It can change a life in a few seconds. It's that powerful. And so I'll come back next year and I'll tell you what that is. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, what I want to talk to you about is encouragement this morning. It's, it's an incredibly empower, powerful ministry. And we underestimate it. And we underestimate what God can do with it. And the Bible talks a lot about it. In fact, God is called. He calls himself the God of encouragement. Do you know that, that God would never put a discouraging thought in your head? If you have a discouraging thought in your mind that's tearing you down or depressing you, can I tell you that didn't come from the Holy Spirit? Our God is a God of encouragement. He would always encourage you. He would always strengthen you. He'd always inspire you to turn to him. He'd always inspire you to believe him and to trust him. And the most powerful thing you can do at any given moment, no matter what situation you are in, and I'm living it right now, amen, <clears throat> the most powerful thing you can do is trust him. Put your trust in him. There's nothing more powerful than you can do than to do that. And so when I'm in trouble, which I am in right now, I say, God, I, I just tell the Lord, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I don't try to figure it out. I don't have to understand everything, but I can trust you. And we need to encourage one another to trust God, amen, to believe God. You know, there is um, a guy who started Chick-fil-A. I think his name is Truett Cathy. He's the founder of Chick-fil-A. Ever heard of that restaurant chain? Anybody here ever eaten at Chick-fil-A? Okay, a few guys. Do they have one in Saskatoon? Is that only an American thing? Okay. Anyways, um, he's a very successful businessman and a believer. And somebody asked him one day, how do you know if... How do you identify somebody who needs encouragement? And so his response to that was, they're breathing. (laughs) Are you breathing this morning? How many people are breathing here right now? You need encouragement. (laughs) So I'm here this morning to encourage you because you need it. You maybe didn't think you did, but you do. And of course, you know, I, I don't know about you, I've never met Somebody that was over encouraged. Have you? Have you ever met somebody who said, you know what, I'm just too encouraged, man. I just, you know, I'm just overflowing. I, no more, don't encourage me anymore. I've just got, I'm filled right up. I'm overflowing. I'm drowning in encouragement. Too encouraged. I need some discouraging thoughts and words to kind of bring me down to level. You ever, ever met anybody like that? 
Ever been too encouraged? No. But you know, discouragement is epidemic. We live in a fallen world, and we live in a world where there's trouble. We live in a world where there's conflict. Every one of us this morning, we have issues. We have situations in our life that would discourage us, every one of us. And we're bombarded by the enemy of our soul. And our whole society, unfortunately, does not help us. Our society is programmed to bombard us with negative messages from all over the place. And so that's what we're living in. That's what people are living in. And so our world is a cursed, dangerous, unfriendly place. And there's warfare. There's heavy spiritual warfare over you, over your children, if you have children, uh, over your family. And uh, let's not be naive. There's spiritual attack going on all the time. You're experiencing it. This church is experiencing it. You will experience it. The people around you are experiencing it. And so the chief weapons of, 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 of Satan, is dis- his, one of his chief weapons is discouragement and deception and fear. You know, that God, you know that God never put a thought of fear in your minds, but we know who would. He says, be anxious. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, or sorry, Philippians chapter 4, he says, uh, the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with much prayer and supplication. Make your request known to God, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. But the Oftentimes we quote that verse, we, we start with be anxious for nothing. But actually the verse before it says, the Lord is near. That's why we're not anxious for anything, because he's near. Where's Jesus this morning? He's right here. He's right beside you. He's in you. He's everywhere. He's right here. And, he, and because he says, hey, I'm here, you don't have to worry about anything. <clears throat> I believe that the Bible commands at a local church should be a place of incredible encouragement. That's why we're here. That's why you're here this morning. We came here through these doors to be encouraged. Amen? Amen. This is a place of encouragement. And that's what a local church should be. You know, in Hebrews chapter 3, it says, "Be, But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today. Is it today? Are we still called today? It says, Then encourage one another day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. In Hebrews 10, 24, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And then in Ephesians 4, 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, none, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it would give grace to those who hear. You know, we know that the early apostles in the early church, that this was a central part of their ministry, and they understood it. And uh, we know that, um, that uh, in, in Acts chapter 13, that Paul and Barnabas were sent out on the first missionary journey, and they went out and they started planting churches. And after they planted a number of churches in Acts 14, it says this, After they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples... They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so Paul and Barnabas are planting churches, and then when they get, when they, when they get to the end of it, they just turn around and go right back through those churches and say, we've got to encourage all these saints. We know that in Acts chapter 15, there was a, a great debate going on uh, as to whether the Gentile churches would, would have to keep the law of Moses. And so all the who's who got together in Jerusalem and had a great debate. And, all the, and Paul and Peter and all the big guns were there. And at the end of, at the end of their, their meeting, they came to a conclusion that basically the Gentile churches did not have to keep the law of Moses and did not have to keep uh, circumcised their children and all the rest of it. They didn't have to do those things. And they just, they just put a few little things in there, and they wrote a letter, and they sent a letter to all the, all the Gentile churches in the land. And they, it was carried, actually, by Silas and by Judas, who were prophets. And it says, so when they were, they, in the first place they went was down to Antioch. It says, when they went down there, having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. 
And when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And then it says, Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren with a lengthy message. He encouraged them. You know, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were thrown into prison for casting a devil out of a demonized girl. And they beat them with rods. And they threw them in the inner dungeon. We know the story. It's a famous story. And as they began to praise and worship God, uh, we know the, an earthquake came and the chains fell off and the prison doors flew open and they got released from prison. And, uh, but you know, we read over some things. Then they left town. But it's really interesting. Just think about it for a second. They were beaten with rods. In other words, they were beaten pretty bad. And then they were thrown down into the inner dungeon and fastened into stocks. Do you think they're in a little bit of pain? Then they finally get released through an incredible miracle. But it says this. They went out of prison, entered the house of Lydia. And when they saw the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. Amen? You think, man, I'm just getting out of this place. I never want to come back here again. Oh, no, hold on a second. We've got one more thing to do before we leave town. Let's get the saints together. Let's encourage them. It's that powerful. It's that, there's that much of an emphasis in Scripture. I could stand here all morning and just quote you verse after verse after verse. Old Testament, New Testament of encouragement. The Bible is absolutely full of it. It's a major ministry, and the good news is every one of us in this room here this morning can get involved. Because people are around you <laughs> need to be encouraged every day, and there's never been a person who's too encouraged. So every person is a candidate for you to minister to that person. Can you imagine what would happen in this church? If this, if, could you think we could increase encouragement in this church? Could we, could we do better? Can you imagine what would happen if this became a place where just incredible encouragement? Do you think the word would get out there? Or could we keep it a secret? I don't think so. I think the word would get out there. Say, you, are you discouraged? Hey, come down to Rock Church. <laughs> it's an amazing place. It's a place where it's a place of encouragement and strength. You'll, it'll change your life. You want your life changed? Come on down here. Because that's what encouragement can do. Paul said this to the church at Thessalonica. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. He commanded them that. See, why is that, why is that so important? Because encouragement can change a person, can transform a person's spirit. You know, uh, George Adams said this, encouragement is oxygen for the soul. We need oxygen to live. You need encouragement to live. It's fundamental. C.H. Spurgeon said this, does people good to be told how highly we value them? There is many a Christian man and woman who would do better if now and then someone would speak a kindly word to them and let them know they had done well. Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. It also says, pleasant words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. You know, I read a story one time where, of course, we're, I don't know if you're a football fan here, but, uh, but the Super Bowl's on next week. But I like football. I like to watch it. And I read a story one time about uh, this guy named Jerry Kramer. And he's, probably most of you have never heard of him, he's a He's a football, football player in the, in the 60s, and he played for the Green Bay Packers. And he was a rookie. He's from Montana. He was a rookie, and he had been uh, drafted by the Green Bay Packers, and he was in training camp, and uh, he wasn't doing good. He was making mistakes, and he was just messing everything up, and he said, I'm doing terrible. I'm just, you know, I just can't do this. I'm a, just gonna, I'm a lousy player. And so he went to the dressing room. And he was sitting in the dressing room by himself, and his face was buried in his hands. He was in despair. And Vince Lombardi, probably one of the most famous coaches in all of football, Vince Lombardi was the coach of the Green Bay Packers. And he came into the locker room, and he saw Jerry sitting there. And he went up to him, and he just, as he walked by him, he just kind of took his hand and ruffled up his hair, and he said these words. He said, uh, don't worry about it, son. One day you're going to be one of the greatest guards in all of football. And he just kept right on walking. Just walked out the door and left the dressing room. That's all he said. Jerry Kramer, wrote, he wrote a book about his life. He said when Vince Lombardi said those words, 
He said something happened to him. He said, I leapt to my feet, and I was never the same again. He became one of the most famous guards in all of football. He was an all-star five times. He, they won five championships. He won two Super Bowls. He's now in the Hall of Fame. He's one of the greatest football players of all time. <clears throat> That's the power of encouragement. One phrase. Don't worry about it, son. One day you'll be one of the greatest guards in all of football. Changed his life. One phrase. That's how powerful encouragement is. You don't really know when you say something to somebody just how life transforming that can be. Absolutely powerful. Have you heard of a guy named Henry Ford? Heard of that guy? We probably would have walked to church this morning if it hadn't been for Henry and a few other guys like him. Well, Henry Ford was a young man. I read the story one time. Henry Ford was a young inventor and he had just was in the process of inventing a gasoline-powered car. And so he was, at a, he was at an inventor's convention in Chicago. And uh, there was another famous inventor there by the name of Thomas Edison. Anybody heard of, the, heard of that guy? It's a good thing because you wouldn't have any lights here this morning, right? So Thomas Edison was an amazing inventor, one of the greatest inventors in all of history. And he was also at the convention. And by this time, Thomas Edison is also a very, a very famous man. So somebody went up to Thomas Edison and said, Hey, see that young guy over there? That's Henry Ford. And, uh, you know, he's, he's invented a, a gas-powered car. And so Edison said, I'd like to meet this guy. And so he went over, and he talked. He was introduced to Henry Ford, and he began to have a conversation. And Edison was asking Henry about his car, and Henry began to explain to him about his invention and what he was doing. And, um, and so uh, all of a sudden, Edison, as he heard the explanation, he got really excited and he pounded his fist on the table and said, boom. And he said, you got it. You got it. What you're doing is amazing. And he walked away. Here's what Henry Ford said. Henry Ford wrote about that encounter and said this. That bang on the table was worth worlds to me. No man up to then had given me any encouragement. I had hoped I was headed right. Sometimes I knew that I was. Sometimes I only wondered. But here all at once, and out of the clear sky, the greatest inventive genius in the world had given me complete approval. Hadn't been for Edison pounding the fist on the table, maybe we'd have still been walking. Amen? One pound on the table changed Henry Ford's life. You know, I remember several years ago, um, Linda and I were just... We felt called to the ministry. We felt like God was calling us to plant a church. And uh, we, went to a, we went to a conference in Regina. I was living in Manitoba at that time. I was a high school teacher. And uh, we were just felt like stirred about the ministry. But I was, un, I, was unsec- I was unsure about so many things. And are we hearing from God? And so we went to this conference. And lo and behold, somehow we got invited to a house at the end of the conference on a Sunday afternoon. And all the main speakers were there. At this in this house. And so when they found out that Linda and I were thinking about planting a church, they began to question us. And we, somehow it just kind of turned out that we were kind of like there was a circle of all these high-powered leaders sitting around us, and they're all firing questions at us like, how do you know you're called to the ministry? How do you know you should, God's ca- calling you to plant a church? Are you sure you know what you're doing? How much Bible school have you had? Which was none at that point. And uh, it's still none at this point. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and so they began to challenge us and question us. They weren't trying to be mean, but they were just questioning, questioning, questioning. Like, how do you know? How do you, you're going to quit your job and you're going to go plant this church? Are you, you sure you're hearing right? Because that's a pretty serious move. You're about to risk everything to do this. And, and let me tell you, at the whole end of the thing, I was shaken by the whole cross-examination. And so we were leaving. And I, I want to be honest with you, I was deflated. And uh, as people were leaving the house, I was going through the door, and there was, a, there was a guy standing there. He was one of those leaders. His name was Bob Stricker, which wouldn't mean anything to you. But, but he was standing by the door, and he, as I walked through the door, he said these words to me. He said, Dave, <clears throat> one day you will not have to defend your call. He said, the day will come when you will not have to defend your call to anybody. <clears throat> I never forgot that phrase. That phrase actually saved me. 
Because I might have gone home and said, oh, forget it. <clears throat> it's all powerful one word is. You know, we know, think about Paul, the Apostle Paul, who we know his story, killing Christians, devastating the church in Jerusalem. He's on his way to Damascus. Of course, he has a great, incredible encounter with Jesus, um, but he's blind. And he's being led into Damascus, and there he was for three days by himself, blind, praying. Can you imagine what's going through Saul's mind, who later became Paul? Can you imagine what's going through his mind? All of a sudden now he has met Jesus, and he's been killing Christians and throwing them in prison for a long time. And he started thinking, oh, my God, look what I did. Look what I have done. I, I persecuted the church. I persecuted Jesus. I get it. I see it now, but look what I have done. How many think he might be just a little condemnation about that point? So he's sitting there, and God speaks to a guy named Ananias, and he says, hey, Ananias, go down to a street called Straight. You're going to find a guy named Saul. And Ananias said, I heard of this guy. And he says, well, I want you to go down there. And so uh, here's what the Lord said to Ananias. The Lord said to him, go. He's a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and, kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. So Ananias departed. And entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, has sent me that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and regained his sight. And he got up and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. In other words, Ananias came and confirmed God's call on his life, encouraged him, and he immediately Saul began to preach the gospel in Damascus. So effectively that the Jews wanted to kill him, and they had to load him over the wall in a basket, and he escaped. Now, we're going to pick that story up in a few more minutes, but I want to just go on to a couple of other things. Of course, we know about Gideon hiding in a wine press. We know that story, famous story, and how the Lord, he was discouraged, he was frightened, he was in fear. Thank you. He was in fear, and uh, the Lord, the angel of the Lord shows up and says, hey, mighty man of valor. That one phrase changed Gideon from a fearful guy beating out a few sheaves of wheat in a wine press to a, a famous warrior who wiped out the entire Mennonite army with some trumpets, uh, candles, and a, and a couple of pitch, and some pitchers and wiped out the whole army and became a, a judge in Israel. That one phrase, Hail, the mighty man of valor, changed his life. You see, one of the things that's incredible about encouragement is seeing things in other people. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but we can see things in other people better than we can see things in ourselves. Is that not true? <clears throat> we can look at somebody else's life and say, look at that person. Look at that woman. Look at that man. Look at that kid. Look at that teenager. Wow, I see such potential there. I see some, I just see stuff in that person. But they don't see it. They can't see it in themselves. And that's true of a church. Like, I travel a lot. So I get to meet a lot of Christians. I get to see a lot of churches. So I can come to this church, for example, and I can look around and say, wow, look at this church. It's growing. I remember when I first started coming here. It's growing. It's gaining strength. I can see the potential. I can see the power in your leaders. I can see the power in, in individuals here. I can see the power in Hannah's life. She led worship this morning. I remember Hannah from a few years ago. I see changed lives. And I say, wow, look at the potential here. But you don't see it. But I can see it. And I've seen that in my own life. I've seen people have come into Harvest City Church and say, and I see them, wow, look at this church. Boom, boom. And they'll say all these things. And I'm thinking, really? You see that? I don't see that. And it's the same thing with your own personal life. People can say, see things in you that you can't see in you. You know, going back to Jerry Kramer, Vince Lombardi was overheard one time speaking to a couple of his younger coaches and some of his other coaches, and they, he was talking about Jerry Kramer. He said, you know what? That kid, that young kid doesn't have a clue how good he really is. Doesn't know how good he is. Can I tell you? You don't know how good you are. You don't know what God can do with you. You have limited yourself to what you think you are and what you can do. But I can tell you that the Holy Spirit in you 
can do amazing things. Amazing things. <clears throat> and of course, Barnabas was a master at this. Barnabas was a guy who's called the son of encouragement. He's actually was name real name was Joseph uh, from, from Cyprus, a Levite. But they changed his name to Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Because he has such an incredible ability to see into somebody's life and say, look at the power that, that's, that's resident in that person's life. I want to pull it out. How do you pull it out? How do you get it? How do you get, cause somebody to rise to their potential? You encourage them. It's just that simple. And so we know that there would never have been a John Mark if there hadn't been a Barnabas. There never would have been a church at Antioch if it hadn't been for Barnabas because he went down to Antioch and he, made, he strengthened that church and it became the, 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 the most amazing church in all the, new, in all the first century church. It was the missionary sending church. It was a church that planted all those churches. It was a church that was sending to send out Paul and send out Barnabas. It was an amazing church. But if without Barnabas, never would have been. That church wouldn't even, party wouldn't even have made it. <clears throat> I don't think that we, we wouldn't have had a Paul if we hadn't had a Barnabas. You know that when, when, when Saul or Paul was led, lowered over the wall in Damascus in a basket, what happened then? Where did he go? Did he go to Tarsus? No, he went to Jerusalem. And it says this in Acts 9. When he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. If Barnabas hadn't done that, the apostles would never have accepted Paul or believed in Paul. Encouragement. You know, uh, Paul caught a revelation of how powerful that was. In his letter to the, book, uh, to Ro- to the church at Rome, the last chapter in Romans 16, it's kind of a chapter you say, well, you know, he's kind of saying greet this person, greet that person. It's just kind of like a bunch of salutations and greetings. It's really not that important a chapter. That the real meat of Romans, of the book of Romans, and it's the most amazing letter, epistle, I think, in the whole New Testament. It's Paul's gospel. It's amazing. Uh, but the very last chapter, see, well, it's not even all important that we even read it. Well, let's ha- let me quote a few verses out of Romans 16. Now, remember, this is a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome. Now, I want you to pretend for a few minutes. I want you to pretend that you're the church at Rome. And I, we've just received a letter from the Apostle Paul. And I happen to be one of the guys that can read in this congregation. And so I'm going to read you the letter. And the people that Paul mentions in Romans in Roman 16, you're sitting out there. Now, I want you to listen to this. Paul says this. I commend to you our sister Phoebe. Phoebe was sitting there in the congregation. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of you, for she herself has also been a helper of many and of myself as well. Now, what if you were Phoebe, and you're sitting there, and you hear that, you hear the mighty apostle Paul address you in that letter? How many think that Phoebe was a little encouraged that morning? Amen. How many, how many think that she got off the, ta- off, off, off the chair and said, you know, I think I'll backslide right now. I think I'm just going to go home and just quit. Do you think, you think so? Or, how many, or do you think that Phoebe rose up the chair and said, whoa, bring it on, man. I'm going, I'm going harder than ever. Amen? I'm just going to give myself even more. Think that that was a response? I do. He goes on. He says this. He said, hey, greet Prisca and Aquila, who happened to be in Rome at that time. Or Priscilla and Aquila. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who for my life risked their own necks, to whom not only do I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles. And greet the church that is in their house. So you got, Pris- you got Priscilla and Aquila sitting there. And, they're say, and, I, and I say to them, hey, Priscilla, Aquila, Paul says, all the Gentile churches are giving thanks for you. Wow. <clears throat> then he says, greet Paeonetus, my beloved, who's the first convert to Christ from Asia, 
And Payanetus is sitting in the congregation. He says, hey, Payanetus, you were the first man. You were the first Christian in all of Asia. Think about that. You were the first. I think Payanetus said, yeah, I was the first. <laughs> Amen? I won't be the last. Then he says, greet, greet Mary who worked hard for you. Then he says this, greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners who were outstanding among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. And so, so Junius and Andronicus are sitting there. And Paul says, you guys are outstanding among all the apostles. And you've been at this longer than me. Whoa. Then he says, the last thing he says is, hey, greet Rufus. Rufus is there. Greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord. Also his mother. His, Rufus' mother was in the church that morning. Greet his mother and mine. So in other words, hey, the mother of Rufus is also, Paul says, hey, you're my mom. You're not just Rufus' mother. You were mother to me too. How many think that just, just encourages Rufus' mother just a little bit? Can you imagine hearing those words from Apostle Paul? What that would do to you? See, Paul was into encouragement big time. He knew the power of it. He knew how transforming it was. <clears throat> and of course, we know that the whole issue of prophecy, we're running out of time here, so the whole issue of prophecy is all about encouragement. Amen? Desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you would prophesy. Why? That the church, that the brethren would receive edification. What is that? Encouragement. That's the function of prophecy. That's why prophecy is so powerful, so important. Say, why is it, why would Paul emphasize prophecy above everything else, above miracles, above signs and wonders, above, above faith? Why? Why is prophecy so important? Why does he make such an issue of that? I'll tell you why. You, see, you know, in fact, he, he devotes an entire chapter in 1 Corinthians 14 to two spiritual gifts, speaking in tongues and prophecy. And I don't know about you, but I thought, hey, Paul, we could have done a, had a chapter on healing. That would have been fantastic. I mean, why did you give us a whole chapter on tongues and prophecy? Why couldn't we have a tongue, a chapter on healing or on faith or on signs and wonders? Have you, are you ever thought that? <sighs> prophecy and tongues? Hey, Paul, why do you, Why? And I thought about it for a long time, then I realized why. Why does the person speak in tongues? What's the main function of speaking in tongues? Pardon? Edification, Edification which means you, it builds you up. It encourages you. It strengthens your spiritual man. Why should we prophesy? What does it do? It encourages the church. Why is that so powerful? Because if you're encouraged, you'll be, rele you'll be released in all the other ones. If you're encouraged personally and you're encouraged as a church, guess what? Faith rises. With faith rises, signs and wonder rise. Healings take place. It's the gateway in. Speaking in tongues encourages you. Prophecy encourages the church. It's the doorway in to all the spirituals. It's the doorway into the spiritual gifts. Encouragement is the door in. You know, you don't have to have some Great words of encouragement. It can just be a timely word. It can just be a one sentence, one phrase, spoken at the right time. How many of you guys are on social media? You're on social media. How many are on Facebook, whatever? Now, Facebook can be, a, can be used, can be very destructive. Agreed? But Facebook can be very powerful. How many of you give birthday greetings on Facebook? Your friends? You get a, a notification, it's somebody's birthday. And so you could do this. You could say, happy birthday. Or you could push like. I want to challenge you. The next time somebody's birthday pops up, do more than that. Make a, just give them one sentence. Just say, you know what? I just want to tell you how blessed I am by knowing you. Hey, you know what? I remember the time when you did this and this. That was such an encouragement to me. Happy birthday. And that's what I've been doing with my Facebook lately, is that when I have a friend's birthday pop up, the easy thing for me to do is say, happy birthday, along with a hundred others. Or I could say, I'm going to take another 30 seconds and just say something positive about that person. Say, hey, happy birthday. I really, you know, I, I just really love the way you help other people. 
Just exactly what Paul did here in Romans 16. We have a great tool. You can be, you don't know what that one phrase could do in that person's life. You don't know what that person's going through. We have a powerful tool right there. You don't ever have to leave your house. Amen? <clears throat> Let me close with this. You know what's something else that's really amazing? That's really encouraging and very powerful? Remembering somebody's name. You know the Bible talks a lot about that? You ever wondered why God puts all those names in the Bible that you hate reading? <laughs> why did God do that? Because names are important. You know the book of Nehemiah? We know Nehemiah did an amazing thing. He built, rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem in 52 days. You know that in Nehemiah chapter 3, he gives everybody's name who did it. There's 80 names in chapter 3 of Nehemiah. Most of those names don't mean anything to us. We don't know have a clue who those guys are. Why would God waste ink and page to put those names on there? Because names are important. And God remembers those who did that. And he's not going to put their name in the Bible. And, we're, and people are going to be reading those names thousands of years later. We're still reading those names. They don't need, mean anything to us, but they're all there. And it's really commending them for their courage and their faith and rebuilding that wall. <clears throat> In 3 John, at the very end of, of 3 John, here's what it says. John is writing to the church. He says, I had many things to write to you, but I'm not willing to write them to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly. And we will speak face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends by what? Name. Greet the friends by name. Now, I'm not great at names. I have to confess that. But my wife is fantastic at names. And what I've seen this over and over and over again. Somebody maybe have been in our church for once, five years ago. And they'll come through the doors of our church, and then we'll see them. She'll know their name. And I've, I've been with her, and she'll say, hi, Bill. And Bill's shocked. And the first words out of his mouth is, you remember my name. It's amazing. And you just see how powerful that was. And you know what the odds are of Bill coming back next week? Pretty high. Wow, you remembered my name. She's amazing at it. Now, she's lamenting that as we've gotten a little older, she's not quite as good as she was before. But let me tell you, she's still the best that we have. She pretty much knows all our church by name, which is over 1,000 people. She knows them all. And she, never, and she doesn't forget. And I've seen it again and again and again, how shocked people are when you say that. But also the pleasure that they're experiencing because somebody remembered their name. And that's why John says, hey, greet the friends by name. So I want to challenge you. you. Say, well, I'm not good at it. Get better. Work at it. Amen? I said, I've asked Linda, how do you do it? And people have asked Linda, how do you do it? She does it by somehow by association. She connects those names to other things. And I've heard that before. I still can't do it. <laughs> but she can do it. But there's just, it's just that simple. Just remembering somebody's name can change them. So let's stand. Let me pray with you this morning. Are you encouraged? Amen. <clears throat> and God has... You can all be in the ministry this morning. One of the most powerful ministries of all. And if every one of us in this room here today said, you know what, I'm going to be a source of encouragement, you could change your family, you could change the people you go, to, you go to work with, the people that you live with, your neighbors, this church, everywhere you go, every day you could get up and say, I'm going to encourage some people here today. And you know what will happen? You'll be encouraged. Because the God of encouragement will encourage you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this church. I thank you for every person in it. I pray you just bless everybody here today. And God, we just, we just accept that challenge from your Holy Spirit today and from the Word of God. Father, let this be a house of encouragement. Let Rock Church in Saskatoon be known as a place of amazing encouragement where you come here and you do not leave the way you came. That God, that you are, that people that come through these doors will receive love, will receive encouragement, and receive prayer. And so, Lord, we just want to, I thank you for this church. I thank you for what you're doing in it. But, Lord, the best is yet to come. Lord, they've hardly started. God, you've got so many amazing things for this church to accomplish and do. 
And so, Lord, I pray. I come against, Lord, every negative thought that the enemy would put in their minds, every limiting thought, that every thought of looking at themselves saying, well, this is who we are. Lord, that's not who they are. You see it differently. And so, Lord, I pray you would open their eyes to see what you see and that, Lord, you would show each one of them what they can do and how powerfully they can affect the lives of people that they connect with, whether it be in this church, whether it be through Facebook, whether it be in all the other avenues in their day-to-day life. Lord, let them be sensitive and sensitized to see what you see. And Lord, would you inspire them by the Holy Spirit. And Lord, give them a prophetic edge to see prophetically in people's lives. And Lord, I commit them today into your care. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.